Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined as always by my trusted colleague, Wes Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field for our only show this week because of Thanksgiving and the Packers playing on Thursday night. So we got a lot of ground to cover in this episode here, Wes. We'll start with reviewing Sunday's big victory over the 49ers, 38-10 to the final score. The Packers get to 8-3. and The 49ers were really banged up. And the storyline for the Packers in this game, as you wrote about, as we've written about really all season long, the two free agents that Brian Gutekunst signed right as the free agency bell rang and the ink was already dry on those contracts. Josh Jacobs and Xavier McKinney, both of those guys playing a huge, huge part in this game as they've done all season. I, I just thought it was so interesting, man. And I know I alluded to this on Twitter probably a little bit more than I put in my story, but you know, both of those guys, they came here to win. But it's been interesting watching how they've added to Green Bay's winning recipe. Um, both of these guys, you know, you listen to Josh Jacobs and Xavier McKinney talk about it. I think both of them made one playoff appearance in their previous stops. That was such a an important thing to them to not only get what they deserve as unrestricted free agents, but also be able to to find places where they can take a, a good thing and make it a little bit better. And for Josh Jacobs, man, who is currently up for the, uh, I think it's the FedEx Air and Ground Player of the Week honor, this guy had 91 rushing yards in the first half. The San Francisco 49ers had not given up a 100-yard rusher in almost three years. In the regular season. In the regular season. Yeah. 54 straight regular season games. And he just imposed his will against them. I thought it was interesting, you know, Matt LaFleur's post-game presser when they were asking, I think it was Steve McGargy from the Associated Press that asked him about, hey, what what was the key to this? And he's like, well, we got that number eight guy back there, and he's pretty good. I mean, I think I also saw a stat that he might have forced like 15 missed tackles or something like that in this game. It was the most, I think, by any by that metric, it was the most by any single running back in a game this season in the NFL. 15 15 whiffs on Josh Jacobs on Sunday. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, and, and he forced it. I mean, it wasn't just that, oh, well, San Francisco 49ers are making bad. I mean, there was a couple of those plays, man. And I'm not even talking like some 40-yard touchdown run. I'm talking about like just taking what potentially could have been a negative yardage play and getting three yards out right. Of it right. in some instances. I mean, this guy is just a Mack truck with this cerebral attitude towards the game where he's just he's processing all this information and you know, I've said it time and time again, but his jump cuts, man, and and taking what the offensive line is giving him and maximizing it, that's what the best running backs do. And then Xavier McKinney won this game in the second half for the Packers. I mean, they, they might have already been in firm control, but with that interception, that is what took any hope that the San Francisco 49ers might have of a comeback and just completely removed all that air from the balloon. 48-yard return sets off a string of three second-half takeaways, and the Packers got the job done. Well, you have to say, with regard to the two big plays McKinney made in this game, he was guarding McCaffrey on the short fourth and two, breaks up the pass, Packers get the turnover on downs, and then the interception, uh, which he has the long run back to set up a touchdown. Both of those plays occurred in Green Bay territory, and when the score was only 17-7, to the Niners were looking to, were in position to make it a one-score game on both of those possessions, and McKinney was the guy who uh, who ended up stopping both of those. So um, he gets his uh, his seventh interception of the season. I think more importantly for the defense, that started another one of these turnover binges where the defense gets three takeaways in the second half. After going basically two and a half games, the fourth quarter of the Jacksonville game was the defense's last takeaway. No takeaways against the Lions or the Bears or in the first half against yeah. the 49ers. So you go two and a half games with nothing, and then suddenly you get three. So hopefully that's a good sign for the defense. But getting back to Jacobs, I've said on this show many times, and I've said it in Insider Inbox and everywhere else, I've been impressed from the very beginning with Josh Jacobs' vision and his footwork and just his, his toughness, his style of running. It's uh, It's been really, really impressive from the start. What we're seeing now is all of that being married up with faking end rounds and pulling guards or doing the duo where they're just double team blocking, going straight ahead. All of this mixing up of how the Packers are running the ball. When you look at it, 
there is there is not just a like the the staple. Okay, this is the Packers running play. This yeah. isn't the days of the Lombardi sweep in the '60s. Matt Lafleur and the way the blocking schemes and everything are set up, you have the the tight ends cutting across to you know to take out defensive ends. You have the receivers coming in and cracking on the second level guys, and you have all the motion that's going on with the receivers and the running backs themselves. Yeah, this uh, the the creativity that's going on in the running game and giving defenses so much to try to decipher as far as what's going on and who's getting the ball, pairing all of that with all of the 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 skills and physical attributes that Josh Jacobs brings to the table, we're we're really starting to see something special in the Packers running game, and hopefully they can continue. Yeah, and it's and it's Jacobs' ability in those instances too to get from zero to sixty pretty quick, uh, being able to get up to speed and where he needs to get and being decisive in those moments. And so many times, running backs really struggle between trying to allow their blocks to set up, but then at the same time also making sure that they get there before the the gap the gaps close. Uh, and it leads to what I like to refer to as almost those twirling little play actions that Jordan Love does, where he almost sometimes will do a full 360 and then hand the ball up. <laughs> the Packers have been able to really open things up. And you know, again, facing a team like San Francisco, where they want to run the ball, they want to you know shorten up the game. They want to play the possession game at the end of the first half. Green Bay did everything they needed to do. If, if San Francisco wants to defer, which is what Kyle Shanahan religiously does, you need to go down the field and you need to get a touchdown right off the bat. And seeing how the running game set up the passing game and some of those big plays they were able to do, that's the hallmark of a good football team. Rob Domofsky wrote about this too. And you had your story last week about the explosive plays. The mix between running the football well and creating downfield explosives, that, that's that, that's how you get in the hunt. Yeah. And, and I feel like we saw in this game, I mean, it could have been even better. Um, unfortunately, Christian Watson doesn't isn't able to bring in that pass, has that drop at the end of the first half. That could have been a 49-yard touchdown. This game could have almost been over here by halftime. Right. The Green Bay Packers, Michael, did what they have to do. And listening to Keyshawn Nixon talk after the game, again, I will not quote him directly, but the Packers, they had to go three games without their quarterback too. And they won those three games. So... Just the way this league goes. Yeah, the Niners. The Niners were as banged up as it gets. They didn't have Brock Purdy. They didn't have their left tackle Trent Williams. They didn't have their best defensive player Nick Bosa. They didn't have one of their starting cornerbacks in Chavarius Ward. But as you said, Wes, the Packers did exactly what they needed to do, which is they jumped on these guys. It was seventeen to nothing before the 49ers had a first down on offense. That is exactly what you do when you have the personnel advantage when the other team is trying to make adjustments for missing top key players the Packers got on top of them no they probably should have put the game away a little sooner than they did but at the end of the day it ends up 38 to 10 it's actually the largest winning margin of victory in the Matt LaFleur era 28 points um and um the other really good sign before we shift our focus to the Miami Dolphins the other really good sign was going five for five in the red zone five red zone opportunities five touchdowns Last week against the number one red zone defense in the league in Chicago, it was three out of five. The sour taste was those two misses were zero points, right. even being able to get any points out of those. But the bottom line is for where the Packers have been near the bottom of the league through the first half of the season in red zone offense, they're now eight of their last 10, punching them into the end zone in the red zone. That hopefully is a good sign moving forward here for the stretch run. Yeah, and the fact that when they, you don't want to have penalties, but when they did, they actually found a way to bounce back from it. Yeah, they had the one on the on the open the opening drive. There was the one red zone penalty, but then they overcame. Didn't even need third down. No. Actually ended up getting the touchdown on, uh, on second down there. So, um, well, it is a short week. The Miami Dolphins are slated to come into Lambeau Field for a Thanksgiving night clash and when you look at this West really this is two teams both of which have generated their own momentum yep. um coming into this game the Packers Packers now eight and three they've won two straight after the the loss to Detroit Miami has now won three in a row um their quarterback Tua Tagovailoa ha- is back from the concussion he's been back for five games and in those five games the Dolphins lost the first two, a couple of shootouts, and then they've won three straight since then. The bottom line is the Miami has averaged 29 points per game since Tua came back. This is an offense that is 
um, incredibly explosive, very much on a roll, and this is going to be a huge, huge test for Jeff Halfley's defense Thursday night. I was talking with Travis Wingfield, uh, who works for the the Dolphins right before this for his podcast, and I, I told him this too, and I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, when Tua is on the field, this is one of the best teams in professional football. Yep. Uh, the, 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 what they had to go through there with losing him, and they've had to do it a couple times now, unfortunately, it just changes everything because it just it's built on his decision making. It's built on his ability to control the field, and obviously the the chemistry that he's built up with all of these receiving weapons. I mean, the Packers. We talk so often about how Green Bay has a multitude of different playmakers they can go to. Yeah, Tyree Kill is one of the preeminent receivers in this league, but it's not just built around him in Miami. They have receivers. They have tight ends. They they list multiple backs as their starter. Uh, they they just there are so many different avenues of playmakers that that McDaniel invites into this offense and again much like what happened with Lafleur getting underneath the the Shanahan and McVay tree and then creating his own style McDaniel has done the same exact thing down in Miami yeah um, it, it's an impressive offense and so much of it is tied into Tua and his ability to create with it well numbers wise. Tua right now has a 106.2 passer rating on the season, which is uh, awfully impressive. He's completing 73% of yeah. the passes. I, this offense, not to say that they won't take a shot downfield, because they certainly will, but this offense is very much predicated on a lot of the quick throws and Tua hitting Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, and those guys, hitting them in stride so that they can yep. get yards after the catch and try to try to get plays to, you know, short, what look like short, simple plays to rupture into big plays. Hill, Waddle, tight end, Jonu Smith, they all have over 500 yards receiving this year. Devon Achan, Raheem Mostert, a pretty good one-two punch in the backfield. And Achan, of course, is he's as good a receiver as he is yeah. a runner out of the backfield. So... Uh, and these guys, Wes, I was looking at it. Um, these guys are incredibly close, so incredibly close to being on a five-game winning streak here because when Tua came back, they lost a 28-27 to game to Arizona in which they blew a two-score lead in the fourth quarter and lost on a walk-off field goal. Mm -hmm. Then the following week, they lose 30-27, to another shootout-type game against Buffalo, they lose that on a 61-yard walk-off field goal by Tyler Bass of the Bills. But then after losing those two heartbreakers now, they've ripped off three straight wins against teams much lower than much lower than them uh, record-wise, or at least uh, lower than them in, in, in the standings overall. Um, but this uh, um, this Miami team, there's all, it's interesting because uh, the before he left the podium on Sunday after their blowout win against the Patriots, Tua was asked about the cold weather in Green Bay because as a quarterback, he's, I believe it's 0-7 yeah, when the right. temperature is under 40 degrees. And right away he was like, hey, it's it's time to bust that narrative. You know, bring it on, let's go. And you have to remember, as much as, yes, it, it sounds like the weather, it's going to be in the 20s or whatever on Thursday night. It's definitely not Miami weather by any stretch. But this is very much the same Miami team that played in absolutely arctic conditions in the wild card round in Kansas City last January. My point is that for all the guys who were in that game, 20 degrees at Lambeau Field is not really no. going to feel all that crazy to them because what they dealt with in in Kansas City in the playoffs last year was absolutely frigid. Um so I can see, you know, and Tua wants to break that whole narrative about his O and whatever record when the temperature is under 40 degrees. Miami is Miami is going to come in here and absolutely give the Packers everything they can handle. Well, and this is this is the this is the heat check right now. No pun intended with the in respect to the <laughs> Packers weather. I mean, I like that. That's good. But I mean, the Dolphins have been a, a really solid football team, and they're beating teams recently the way that you would expect them to beat them with Tua back in the lineup and with the weapons that they have. I think one thing I love most about Miami is that, you know, they have a Chan who comes out of nowhere. Mostert is this, you know, ageless wonder as well, but they still go and draft Jalen Wright. Jalen Wright is contributing in this offense too. I mean, it's in a lot of ways, you almost have a three headed monster back there. Um, you look at, you know, Jalen Waddle, what he's been able to accomplish. You mentioned Smith as well. Smith is a guy that I think the league has been really enticed by for a bulk of his career. Um, it seems like he's finally sort of in, I think he's probably 29 years old at this point, but 
he sort of realized the potential that that New England had sort of seen in him and these other programs, thinking that, hey, th- this t- dude could be a potential playmaker. He's fit well into what the Miami Dolphins want to do offensively. Uh, and yeah, they're going to be super motivated to put that behind him. You can even tell it. So many times it's the media that drives a lot of these narratives going into it. You can tell listening to Tua, listening to these guys down in Miami this week, they are fully embracing this for what it is. Yeah. You know, for as much as again, it's not Miami weather, but they we we were there on Christmas, the second coldest game in that stadium's history. It was like fifty one degrees at kickoff. I mean, yeah, they they you know, Miami, Florida and South Florida is pretty warm a lot of times of the year. But I mean, when you play in that division and you, you see the teams that you face, you're gonna have to, you know, come up and rise up to these these matchups. So uh, I, I am fully anticipating you're gonna see their best effort in this one and obviously trying to get back to 500 and, and show that there's still a lot of fight left in this thing despite losing Tua for as long as they did. Yeah, they lost him for a month. They went, uh, I believe it was one and three in the uh, in the four games that they missed. One passing touchdown, too. That is wild. They had one passing yeah. touchdown during that straight. Yeah, their, their, off, their offense was really struggling. It's worth pointing out because we've pretty much just talked about Miami's offense to this point. Miami's defense... Very good. It's... There is there is nothing that jumps off the page at you except that when you look at their rankings across the board, whether you want to look at rushing yards, passing yards, total points, third down, red zone, whatever category you want to look at, it's very difficult to find a defensive category in which they are not in the top 10 or 12 in the league. They're not like number one in anything. No. You know, They're not up in the top one or two in a whole bunch of things. But they're not in the bottom half of the league in almost anything. They're up there in the top 10 or 12, uh, just about every category. Um, this, this, is, this is a defense that is played, has played pretty steady and pretty consistent. It had, as I mentioned, had a bad fourth quarter against Arizona that cost him a game. Um, and then Josh Allen kind of did you know what Josh Allen does, and, uh, and the Bills put up 30. But since then, um, since then, teams have not been able to do much. And in fact, and, and I know New England is struggling, but you know, New England was down. What was it, thirty-one to nothing before yep. they even scored any points last week against uh, against this Miami defense. So, as much as this is a, a, a big time challenge for Jeff Halfley, um, this is no picnic for Jordan Love and company. A lot of positive signs we're seeing with the Packers on offense. No turnovers for the offense in this last game. We talked about Josh Jacobs and the running game. But uh, um, but this is uh, this is this is going to be a tough a tough matchup for Green Bay. Very interesting matchup too, in that it features the oldest team in the National Football League in Week One versus what was the youngest team in the National. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I think uh, if I understood that right, I, I believe the it, again I'm doing this off the top of my head. I think the Dolphins have 23 players who are 29 or older on their team. Wow. Uh, a lot of those players are on the defensive side of the ball and in credit to them, you got guys like Calais Campbell who's still their leading sacker this season. Must be 34, 35 years old at this point. Who apparently been... Mike McDaniel stood on the table for Campbell because yeah. there were rumors about him getting traded at the trade deadline and Mike McDaniel was like, do not trade that guy. And and the Dolphins hung on to him. And they are very much, I mean, they're trying to work their way back in the playoff race in the AFC, but they are definitely not out of this. No, not at all. And in a guy like Campbell, you're talking about an NFL man of the year, a guy that has been one of the most dominant interior forces for the last decade in this league. And, and the guy, I'm really enjoying them, Mike. I talk about how old they are, and, and obviously Jalen Ramsey's there. Jordan Poirier was signed with them in the offseason. But Chop Robinson is putting some really good things on film, too, as their first-round pick. And when you have a young guy that can come in and, and start to make an impact like he's done and, and being sort of sprinkled into this defense a little bit, uh, it's a very formidable group. And, and at the top of this thing is Anthony Weaver, who was a, among this uh, mass exodus because of just accomplishment that was in Baltimore last year. Guys becoming coordinators, you know, moving into bigger positions. Weaver gets this opportunity down in Miami and I think there's a culture and there's a thought process and I think there's definitely an energy you can feel that maybe wasn't there last year with Vic Fangio that you know these guys really he has them believing in what they're doing and even in those games where they didn't have Tua defensively they were as competitive as they've ever been in a lot of those matchups trying to keep their team in it so uh, yeah Miami again that it presents a lot of different looks and things that Green Bay's going to have to take into account for all right. Well, I want to get to our keys to victory in this one, but I will take care of some sponsor business. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 
365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl. Cousin Subs, 50 plus years of better. All right, keys to victory. I think the the first thing that jumps out to me in this game is this is a game that defensively you have to tackle well uh, because busted tackles is what leads to the ruptured plays, and that is how Tyreek Hill and Jaden Waddle and Devon Achan and these guys, you know, they 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 are the masters in many ways of turning five yard gains into two yes. five yard gains. That's what they do. And uh, the Packers defensively have to absolutely be on their P's and Q's with the tackling, which is, it's always interesting, you know, a Thursday game, short week, guys are just trying to get their bodies back. You never quite know in these short week situations where players are going to be fundamentally. Are there going to be more fundamental breakdowns? Because you, you don't do much in practice the whole week. The whole week is really a week of mental preparation, and the only thing you're doing physically on the field is more walkthrough and jogging yeah. kind of stuff. You're not having any real practices like you do when you have the full seven days in between games. But for me, this one this one starts with how well will Green Bay tackle on defense. Can I before I get into this, someone was praising you at inbox, and as they should. I mean, we we do our final thoughts video every week, and you know how we always give our little thoughts and last week. Yeah, the Packers win if, which is the final segment. In mine was punching the ball in. They went five for five. Yeah, we were talking about red zone. And, and then you had yours, which was... Um, to get a takeaway. To get a takeaway. And they got three of them. Can I just put you on blast for one thing? Okay. Uh, when we did three things last week, I love how I think you finished yours with, you know, and I'll be very surprised if this thing doesn't come down to the last minute of the game or something like that. And then the Packers ended up having their biggest win ever uh, with Matt LaFleur. You just never can tell. That's right. You, know? you never can tell. Of course... We did we did film three things on Wednesday, and we had no oh, yeah. idea that Brock Purdy yes. wasn't going to play. So yeah. I'll just say that. But yes, you're right. Go all it's different. funny when you look at it, and I did say I expected that game with the Niners to go right down to the end, and then of course it didn't. That so, didn't somebody was I just got a kick out of because somebody's praising us for all this stuff at inbox, and I'm thinking of all the weeks where I could not have been more wrong uh, with <laughs> final thoughts. But okay, so here goes. Here's my big prediction uh, with this one. One. Uh, Green Bay actually can't allow them to get their running game going. I thought last week, yes, the the pace of play had a lot to do with that. Getting up to that lead had a lot to do with that. I think we were in the middle of the second quarter by the time that Christian McCaffrey got his second carry in that game. But even so, Miami hasn't actually run the ball that well this year. Uh, HN has is a is a huge weapon for them in the passing game. Five receiving touchdowns as a back this year, he hasn't had those big explosive moments uh, like he had his rookie season. Um, you, you look at Mostert, Mostert, he's been okay this year. You have to try to make this thing one-dimensional with Tua and try to get after him. 29 sacks so far this season have been allowed by that offensive line. Uh, again, there's been multiple quarterbacks there, but I think pressure is going to be very important. But I, I really do think it all starts with containing their run game. If you can take the things that you did well, uh, and certainly the offense played into that too, but, but defensively with them being able to not allow much breathing room to that that rushing offense for the 49ers, this is still the same tree that this branch is coming off that Shanahan tree. And if if you allow Miami to get that run game going, then that's when Tua becomes extremely dangerous. Yeah, and you bring up a good point about how the Packers played run defense, run defense against the 49ers. Christian McCaffrey, yes, he missed a big chunk of the season, but he's still the reigning NFL yes. Offensive Player of the Year and a guy with fresh legs at this point because of that time that he missed. Packers only allowed him 31 rushing yards on 11 carries. And in fact, I put together my series of clips for what you might have missed for those who want to check that out on Packers.com. Six of those 11 carries, Packers held him to two two or fewer yards on uh, on six of those 11. So that, uh, um, that was a heck of a job up front uh, by the run defense and something I agree with you that needs, uh, that, that needs to continue. Um, on, so those are two keys to victory on the defensive side of the ball for the Packers what do you think on the offensive side protect the football um yeah you want to get more takeaways and things like that but I thought last week showed and, and there were some close calls there don't get me wrong uh there were some moments there for San Francisco to make plays that it didn't but that being said I, I thought this this game against the 49ers illustrated what is possible when you don't hurt yourself with penalties and you protect the football 
Uh, Green Bay outlasted the 49ers. They routed them, but they outlasted them. Uh, they were able to maintain that throughout four quarters. Uh, a lot of guys afterwards, it was the buzzword among the media asking if this was the most complete game that Green Bay has played this season. What you give it, put whatever narratives you want on top of it, especially considering the state of the opponent. But I, I just felt like the complimentary football side of thing and, and looking at how the Packers were able to transition and turn those po- those takeaways into points, that was the difference in that football game against the 49ers. So uh, you look at Miami's defense, it's been very opportunistic at times this season. They will hurt you with the interceptions if you allow them to. Green Bay has to, and Jordan Love has to protect the football. Yeah, and I, I certainly hope that uh, that the Packers stay as persistent with the running game yeah. as they've been. And Josh Jacobs is coming off a 26-carry game. It's a short week. Uh, he certainly uh, looks no worse for wear, and he will take the ball any time that Matt LaFleur wants to give it to him. But I tell you, if I'm Emmanuel Wilson or Chris Brooks, I'm ready to get the ball in this game as well yeah. because the last thing Matt LaFleur wants to do is if Josh Jacobs needs a breather and he has to come out, that now suddenly it's like, okay, well, now the Packers have to throw the ball. No, they're going to want Emmanuel Wilson and Chris Brooks to be able to run the ball and to continue whatever it is that Jacobs establishes uh, when he does need to come out and get a breather. And uh, and hopefully the Packers can just keep things going on the ground, what they, what they have shown recently. I should say a word here about Chris Brooks, because for him, this is obviously facing his former team in the Miami Dolphins, a team that he had a lot of success with as an undrafted free agent last year, has the concussion during training camp, gets injuries settled, and now he ends up here in Green Bay. The amount of pony that we've seen this year, the amount of the two running back packages we've seen this year, in the aftermath of the injuries to A.J. Dillon and also Marshawn Lloyd, if you had told me the Packers would be lining up in that as frequently as they have been <laughs> in the first half of the season, I would have said you are nuts. Right. But that shows not only the, the faith that they have in Emmanuel Wilson, but then for Chris Brooks to come in, and he had a tripping penalty that I'm sure he definitely wants back, but by and large, his ability to pick up blitzes, his ability to run the football, there was some motioning that was happening last week between him and Josh Jacobs, and right. I think there was even a play where Jaden Reed was in the backfield with him at one point. Chris Brooks, dude, for being a guy that was not here during training camp, his ability to function within this offense and allow Green Bay to stay in their preferred packages, uh, he's another guy that I don't think you can say enough about and will be very critical in this matchup against his former team. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we go looking around the league at the most recent results very quickly, um, as we said, Packers are 8-3. and three. Detroit still on top of the NFC North at 10 and 1, Minnesota in between Green Bay and Detroit at 9 and 2. The Vikings end up surviving a furious comeback by the Chicago Bears. The Bears get 11 points in the last 30 seconds of regulation to force overtime, but then Minnesota wins an OT, one of just several crazy games uh in the early window on Sunday. Dallas and Washington played a wild one and uh and Dallas ends up getting the win. Kansas City needs a walk-off field goal to beat the Carolina Panthers down in Charlotte. And the Houston Texans take uh take a a, a bad home loss against the Tennessee Titans when Houston's kicker misses a chip shot that uh that should have uh forced overtime in that game. I will say since we're kind of calling each other out and putting each other on blast you kind of dismissed my thought last week of watch to see how Washington responds to yep. getting steamrolled in the fourth quarter by the Philadelphia Eagles. And you're like, well, it's the Dallas Cowboys coming in. Well, that's why you just you can't always dismiss that kind of stuff because Washington didn't respond well to a really tough division loss where they got run over in the fourth quarter by Philly. They took a bad home loss to the Dallas Cowboys and uh, which certainly helps the Packers in the playoff picture that Washington now has five losses. But Jaden Daniels, a rookie quarterback, and what's going on in Washington, he, that, that's something to watch now because they've dropped two in a row and, and the you know the, the shine is coming off the Christmas ornament a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And, and looking at the, the Cowboys very quickly, people want to really rip on Mike and, and everything that's happened out there. For him to build a winnable game plan for Cooper Rush looking as good as he did in that game, uh, Dowdle becoming their featured back, I thought had one of his best games as well. Um, you, you tip your cap to him in that phase. Very odd ending to it, but the, the Cowboys did what they had to do to win. Yeah, 41 points in the last nine minutes. And then an onside kick that was returned for a touchdown when it didn't matter. I mean, the, the things just happened at the end of that game that I am yeah. not quite understanding. But Yeah, the, yeah, the Cowboy, Cowboys picked up an onside kick and ran it for a touchdown when you just need to slide, kneel the game out. They run for a touchdown, and Jaden Daniels gets a shot at a Hail Mary on the final play because 
the Cowboys didn't just take a stupid knee. It was just so it was, bizarre. Yeah, so many but, bizarre things going on in that game. But Washington, this is, again, this is where you have a young team, a, a different type of team uh, with a lot of new pieces, and, and Daniels having to be the franchise guy. They're very interested to see how they respond. Uh, the Chicago Bears had one job. Uh, they failed. Uh, and <laughs> this this losing streak that they're on continues. By the way, have you peaked at all at their schedule, the the Bears' schedule here the next month? Well, I know that. I mean, they 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 still have uh, they still have both of their games left with Detroit. They haven't yeah. played they haven't played the Lions. So listen to this meat grinder. So they had, they lost three. They they've lost five in a row out of the bye. They lost three in a row at home. Here's what they now face: at Detroit, at San Francisco, at Minnesota, and then you come back against Detroit at home. And then they wrap up against uh, Seattle, and then they come to Green Bay. Uh, very, very rough turn of events for the Bears. Yeah, Bears are Bears are sitting at four and seven in three games: the 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 game against Washington, the game against the Packers, and now this last one against uh, against the Vikings. Um, three games they've lost on the final play of the game when uh, when they they had uh, they had opportunities to win, and uh, um, yeah, the. I mean, you know, the Bears got they got another field goal blocked early in that game, which then I think influenced a decision to go for it on a fourth and four instead of kicking a field goal, you know, in like the third quarter. Just all these all these things that then added up to, you know, they had another terrible special teams mm-hmm. play where the, you know, the guy had the punt bounce off his leg and the Vikings recovered. They end up getting a touchdown. All these things that add up to, you know, they're down by two scores in in the last two minutes and then. They pull off this amazing, you know, touchdown, two point conversion, recover the onside, kick the field goal to get it to overtime, and they win the toss in overtime. Yep. And then they go, then they go three and out. The Vikings win the game anyway. So yeah, and, and for Minnesota, I, it just Kevin O'Connell keeping that team together, staying balanced. Uh, yeah, and J- J- you know, again, Josh Jacobs has been a tremendous find for Green Bay. He's the right running back for this offense and a guy that you can feed, and he's durable. But Aaron Jones is looking good too. Still had a fumble early in that game, but they stuck with him, and he showed him to be right again in that instance. And you know, Minnesota just keeps finding a way. I did say this in inbox, and I do truly mean this. And we'll just have to keep a pin in it the rest of the season. But to me, this is starting to remind me a lot of that 22 team they had, where they won a lot of football games. Very curious to see how high their ceiling runs once you get to the postseason. But they're beating the teams they have to beat. And I will close on this. The statistic, and I don't know if it was Tom Fanning that found it, but that stat about how the Green Bay Packers at 8-3 and three have the best record since, I think, the merger in 1970 at 8-3 through 13 weeks of the season, but to still be in the third or third place or worse within the division. That's never yeah. happened. And again, it just speaks to this division, how difficult it is, how tight it is, and the fact that of those handful of losses the North has, three of them were doled out to each other. It's just, it is a wild, wild development. And uh, Green Bay just has to keep winning football games and trying to pick up another intra-conference game on Sunday. Yeah, well, three quarters of the NFC North playing on Thanksgiving with the Bears going to Detroit, the Packers hosting Miami. The only NFC North game to watch on Sunday when the Packers are not playing will be Minnesota playing against, uh, against Arizona. Chaos theory. You and I, we are already sitting here calling ourselves out for some bad predictions <laughs> is there any chance the chicago bears losers of five in a row can go into ford field and win on thanksgiving i don't i certainly don't like their chances but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna give me a percentage we, we there's no there's no gambling in bushwood but like what what do you think is for give me a percentage that you think they can win straight up 20 percent. okay cool let's see what happens yeah i mean this, I mean, honestly, in in a lot of ways, this is this is a lot like where Detroit was on Thanksgiving last year when the Packers came. Yeah, the Packers were four and six at that time. The Lions, I think, were eight and two. Yep. Um, nobody really gave the Packers a chance. They hadn't shown a whole heck of a lot. The Bears, in some ways, have shown more than yep. the Packers showed last year yeah. at this time because they've just lost some heartbreaking yep. games that have led to this four and seven record. So, um, but uh, but there's it just. It feels like just everything, all the all the the negativity going on with Eberflus right now, yeah. head coach of the Bears. It, it just feels like it's too it's too much to overcome for the Bears to start to put together a run here, as close as they've been in some of these games. If you would have told me back in September that we would get to Thanksgiving, it looks like Caleb Williams is a player. 
Their defense is playing pretty well. And the fact that they are plus nine in turnover differential right now, in their four and seven? Yeah, plus nine, plus nine, but uh, three games under 500 at Thanksgiving. That's that's crazy. Do you know how far you have to go down on the turnover differential to find a team without a winning record other than Chicago? Like, it's like all the way, It's I think it's like L.A., the Rams are like 16th in turnover differential and are below 500. It's wild. Yeah. It is kind of crazy. Bear down. Yeah, bear, bear down indeed. Well, the home of the 2025 NFL Draft is right here in Green Bay, so don't miss any draft action coming April 24th through April 26th of 2025. Visit greenbay.com slash draft25 for more information. Can I ask you one last question? Sure. Because uh, we won't see each other for another week. My coach sort of. The, of. Yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> in these chairs. In these chairs. Um Last week, I was quoted as saying that Mike Tomlin should be the NFL coach of the year, which could still end up being the case. They, they took a bad loss to Cleveland. Dennis Krause had asked me this question after they lost. So maybe it's still Tomlin. Who's the NFL coach of the year right now? Oh, boy, you're really putting me. But see, I had the same exact response. Put me on the spot. Because I'm really opinionated on the coach of the year stuff. You know, I always talk about it being the AP makes it a flavor of the month competition. Here's here's one here's one I'll throw out that not a lot of people are talking about. Nick Sirianni maybe deserves. That's a great pick. The That's way, a great way pick. Phil, the way Philadelphia completely yep. fell apart at the end of last season, and the way Nick Sirianni has those Eagles playing right, right. now after taking a couple early season losses, and now there's still a half a dozen games left in the regular season. Oh, oh for a sure, a ton of stuff can happen. But you're asking me that question right now. That's kind of the that's kind of the first one that pops into my yeah. It's just weird because, like, I, somebody had asked me this, and I'm like, everybody, it's been, you know, because it's like, okay, so, well, you, you're so opinionated on this. Who should be the coach of the year? I'm like, well, me personally, maybe it should just be who the best teams are, and then that's where you pull from. But, like, all the people that they wanted to put it on, like, Dan Quinn. Well, yeah, now that, that's the thing. Now Washington suddenly lost two in a row. Yeah. Everybody's wondering what's up with them. So Jim Harbaugh, they lost again now. Like, yeah. Eh. Anyway, I wanted to ask you that because otherwise we're never going to talk about it. So. <laughs> I mean, well, well, let's that. let's revisit yeah. when, uh, when that's a good pick. Comes. So with that, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of Thursday night's big game at Lambeau Field between the Packers and the Dolphins. We'll have it all for you on Packers.com. For Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and we will see you next time.